HR professionals, business owners, and operations at all levels are struggling to figure out what needs to change. Our system has been shocked, practices have been questioned, and conversations are finally happening. We all know there has been a huge shift in what people want. Inclusion and diversity are common phrases, but often misunderstood. Generations are coming together more than ever on what's important. Mental health has been brought to the forefront of everyone's mind. Let's humanize these conversations. Let's talk about what's important for employees to be successful in life and at their job, and how companies can create an environment to allow them to do both. Because successful people will make up a successful workforce. I'm Leanne Lovely. Let's get this conversation started. I have a great conversation with a business owner today, Robin Alario. Robin has a passion for helping people. Her decision to purchase an existing Assisting Hands home care business came out of her desire to make a difference and help people in a way she wished was available for loved ones in years past. And now as a business owner, I have the opportunity to talk with her about the struggles and triumphs she has experienced. So I have been in business five and a half years. I bought my business existing in 2017 of June, did not have experience in this field. We have an uh, in-home care, non-medical agency where we help elderly folks, disabled folks um, in their home with activities of daily living to help them stay independent. And the goal is to remain at home and happy where they should be. Um, I had family members way back when um, that really would have benefited from these services. So when I saw this opportunity presented to me, I kind of jumped on it. Um, I love helping people. It's kind of my passion. And then to think um, that I could have helped family members back in the day and couldn't um, and uh, saw this as an opportunity to be able to kind of pass that on to other folks and help other people navigate through some hard times. Um, and five and a half years later, here I am. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, I I didn't even get a chance to say thank you so much, Robin, for joining me today. And that's, it's, it's an amazing, um, you know, it's amazing when you can kind of in retrospect, look back to a passion of, you know, what you were missing when you needed Mm -hmm. it, and then to be able to turn around and now be able to provide the service that um, was lacking um, for you to somebody else and know that you're that you're providing that you're providing a, a form of comfort it's not a form of I mean it is a comfort right yeah yeah, yeah it is and it's necessary um obviously the the last thing people want to do is put a loved one in a nursing home or assisted living facility so as long as they can safely remain at home with our services it's kind of a win-win So tell me a little bit, um, you know, a a little bit more about the services that you provide. I mean, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about it. So it's it's all non-medical. So things that fall under non-medical services include anything from um, helping someone get out of bed in the morning, getting them dressed. Um, We have folks that have very little care needed. Maybe they just need help with laundry or some light housekeeping that kind of keeps them being able to stay at home. Um, We have other people who need full on care and we have a mechanical lift that gets them out of bed and puts them into a wheelchair and we have to bed bath them and um, things like that. So we have all levels of care that we provide. Um, It just depends on the level of need of the client. And so, um, but we do all kinds of incontinence care, showering, any kind of personal care. We do that, helping them, you know, do their hair, get them dressed, make meals for them. We do medication reminders. We can't dose medication. We can't administer meds, but we can remind them and kind of keep them on track with that. Um, We can go grocery shopping for them. Like I said, laundry and light and housekeeping. Companionship is kind of goes with everybody. So Right. And I think that all of us, um, you know, as I get older, um, I'm not that old yet. But as I get older, I think to myself, you know, I want to stay in my own home, right? The goal is to, to stay in my home with my husband um, for as long as I can. And I remember experiencing this with my grandmother. Um, 
she the hardest thing for the family was to eventually know that she couldn't stay in her home anymore. Um, and that's and that's part of what you are able to provide is that that individuals mm-hmm. get to stay, have the freedom of being in their own home. But have somebody who comes in and provides them with the companionship, with the ability to stay in their home while being able to do some of those those day to day activities. Right. Right. Yeah, that's the goal. Well, great. So ownership. That, you know, for for us who aren't haven't taken that leap, we think, oh, yeah, I could buy a business, right? I could, I could do that. But often, you know, we think of ownership as we're going to go and do this thing. But it's so much more. And a lot of the owners, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the owners that I talk to, the first thing that they'll say is, wow, I didn't know what I didn't know. Oh, yes. <laughs> so for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, how's it going? I mean, you're five years in, which means that what I, is it five years? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you're you're of the of the percentile that's that's going to make it at this point, according to statistics. Right. Yeah. Yeah, five years is kind of that mark. I'll be six years in June, so I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> I think I can make it now. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yeah. we, it's what I, I can't even remember the statistics on that, but it's like 10% of businesses don't make it to the five, or I'm sorry, uh, 10% of businesses make it, which yeah. means that 90% yeah. of businesses don't make it to that five, that, that five year mark. Yeah. Which is insane. Yeah. I mean, it is. When you think about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it's because you don't know what you don't know. I think if you knew, if you knew more, you probably wouldn't do it. Is, is what, <laughs> what, looking back, if I had known what I know now, maybe would I have not taken the leap? Probably a, a high likelihood that I might have, you know, not. But sometimes that's what you need. You got to just dive in. Right. Right. Yeah. I I, th- I think you're right. If you would have known all of the the triumphs and the um, trials that you would have gone through, that you are going through, I'm sure, still on a daily basis. Oh, but yes. now you've had yeah. five years to iron out some of the bugs. Mm-hmm. So w- tell me a little bit, you know, this, this season has been dedicated a lot to what does it take to hire, train, retain, so what is yeah. right now the biggest hurdle that you're struggling? And I know that you and I talked a lot about yeah. that hiring piece. For us right now, honestly, it's not really the retention. It's more the hiring and getting them in the door. Um, you know, it seems as though we have a lot of activity, but just getting them to actually show up for interviews and, you know, or we'll interview them and everything sounds great. And we get them all on, you know, all set up for onboarding and they don't show up or we go through all that. We get them on board and do all that. And then they don't show up for the first shift or whatever the case may be. So that's our biggest struggle right now. I feel like we have a good handle on the retention part of it because we really do a lot for our caregivers. You know, it's a hard job. It is, not a high paying job. Um, There's a lot expected of them. Um, You can get caregiver burnout really easily. So we try to do little things to make them feel appreciated, valued, those kinds of things. So I feel like we have a relatively good handle on once we get them in and they're viable and they actually start working, um, aside from you know, kid issues or transportation issues, that seems to be a big part of it. But in general, people seem to really like working with us when we do get them to that point. So right now it is actually the hiring, the actual finding people, getting them in the door and getting them onboarded and ready to go. That seems to me, we lose a lot of hours right now. Our our business is measured in hours per week, Mm -hmm. uh, care hours. We've been losing quite a few care hours a week because of that piece of it. We just need more. We just need so many more people to be able to keep up with our demand. And that's not 
inconsistent with almost everybody that I talk. We need more people. Yeah. We're Which not- makes me feel a little better. Right. <laughs> right. It's not something I'm not, it's not unique to me, but right. Um, it's valid for sure. So why do you think that the people and you, I mean, you mentioned a couple of things, you, you treat them great. You, you, so what are some of the things that you're, that you do? And don't give away all your secrets, right? <laughs> I don't know. No. So we have, you know, we, we're very communicative. So, which we expect the same in return. Mm-hmm. Um, we are flexible, you know, working with it. We understand things come up and we understand people have stuff. So we try our best to work within their, um, within what they, what they're able to do. But I think we do a good job recognizing we have, you know, caregiver of the month that we do. So we pick somebody every month and if they're chosen, they get, you know, of course the recognition, you know, congratulations to so-and-so they get their name up on a little board. They get an embroidered branded scrub top. They get a gift card from Walmart. So it gives them something to strive for. Um, we are going to be starting doing like quarterly, um, caregiver drop-in days where we'll pick a day in each quarter and we'll have goodies and coffee and juice and, you know, kind of, they can just sort of stop in during the day and we'll have a little goodie bag for them. Um, so, you know, I think we just, we try to build that culture. We're a team and, um, that we do value them. So that seems to go a long way. And of course, everybody loves little treats and <laughs> incentives like that. <laughs> so Absolutely. So yeah. going back to the, you know, the hiring, getting people to show up, yeah. are you offering any type of, um, you know, incentives to, hey, show up and have cookies? I don't know, show up to the yeah. interview and, you know, or how are you going about reaching out to individuals? You know, how, yeah. and I, and I ask I have, this because, yeah. because being in the recruiting industry, obviously, everybody comes to me and says, how do we, how do we combat that? How do we get them to show up to the interview? How do we, and I never have that solid answer of like, oh, yeah. this is what you need to do because everybody's experiencing that same problem. Yeah. So it's always that question of what are you doing to get this person to show up that day or why are they saying that they'll accept the job and then they don't show up on that day what Mm -hmm. is it that they've got five other job offers and they just decided or they just decided you know what I'm not going to go to work today and then they're stunned that they don't have a job Yeah. And I think it's a little bit of all of that because we're, you know, we're working with human beings. And so human nature and human psychology kind of goes to, you can't read everybody's mind as much as we rack our brains in our office on a daily basis, trying to like get inside everybody's head, why they do this, why they do that. Um, But maybe doing some more incentives to get them in the door is probably a good idea. We just haven't fine-tuned that, I guess, and haven't really come up with anything viable. Sometimes we wonder if people, if we're getting them, we're grabbing them on Indeed or Career Plug, and we have that interview, and then we set up, we do all the stuff, and then we set them up for the onboarding. Um, If they're using that as a means for their unemployment requirements, I don't know. I, sometimes I, sometimes I think that's, part of it because I know unemployment does not follow up with me they're not saying hey did so-and-so apply for a job I've never once had unemployment call so Mm -hmm. likely as they could be you know um doing that I don't know so you know maybe something to entice them to actually come to the interview which worries me a little because if I have to bribe them to come for a job interview how are they going to be as an employee that does concern me right um but you know, sometimes you feel like you'll do anything though to get at least people in the door. So mm-hmm. that might be, I'm kind of old school. I feel like you expected to do this, you just do it. And that's, and yeah. Right. And there's a lot of us right. out there who, well, Hey, if I commit to something, I'm going right. to, I'm going to follow through on that. But that's the way that I was, that's the way that I was raised. That's the way that mm-hmm. I, you know, that's the way that my brain works. Yeah. There, there's an entire population of people out there that, 
and and it's it's a symptom of the economy that that we're living in. Yeah. It's a symptom of of a lot of things. It's a symptom it of is. the younger generation and that the way that they were raised. It's the way that so you you're right. You can't pinpoint it, it being one thing. I was raised by a very um, you know, strict I don't want to say st- strict, but you know, a, a father who good, and a good mother, values. Correct. <laughs> mm-hmm. Those were their values. Put the yeah. the hey, if you commit, you follow through. Mm-hmm. If you say you're going to be somewhere on time, you show up on time. If you agree to do something, it, you know, that's that's your it's like signing a contract and you don't yeah. <laughs> break contracts. And sometimes I feel like boy, I'm really getting old because I find myself, well, back in the day, I would never have dreamt of, and I'm like, Robin, you know, now you really sound like an old person because, but (laughs) I think, I think that is part of it though. It's just my, I never would have dreamed of calling into work unless I was on my deathbed. It just wouldn't be something I would have to figure it out. Right. Um, That mentality is not necessarily there anymore. And a lot of the people we have are younger because that's the, age of the people doing the job that we are, you know, requiring them to do, which is fine. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so yeah, so you know that I'm glad you kind of mentioned that enticing them to kind of come to the interview, maybe some little, you know, even if we just say, hey, we're gonna, we'll have snacks and drinks. And we do, we do have, we have a refrigerator stocked with drinks and a basket of snacks Mm and a basket of toys that they can grab one for their kid. You know, if they, some of them have to bring their kid with them to the onboarding. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You know, Um, right. But maybe I should state that up front, you know. (laughs) So, well, and, and it's, I've worked in the staffing industry for how many, having people show up for onboarding or with their child is not, you know, we, I I think to myself, well, what are you doing? But if they're not making money, paying for childcare is, is not an easy thing to do or even finding somebody in the middle of the day for two hours is just not feasible for them. There right. are, so there I, don't, are, I don't have an issue with that. Therefore, the, the basket of toys, <laughs> right? Because I recognize that that's a pot, you know, that's some people's reality and that's fine. So, right. But I used to have a, a drawer with a bunch of markers in it when mm-hmm. I was in, when I was working in the light indus- uh, industrial and I'd be like, okay, get the thing of markers and a piece of paper and they can sit and, and color because yeah. for an hour, I need your attention and not the attention of the child's you know, right. Yeah. And again, it's, it's a symptom of one, you know, I I never used to call in sick. I I never used to call in sick. Think about how much that is, is changing Mm -hmm. where all of a sudden your employer, you get to work and they're like, wait, 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 you're coughing. You're, you're sneezing. Exactly. And and all of a sudden you're like, you mm -hmm. need to go home. Yeah. My line of work too. Um, we gotta be super careful. Like I don't Mm -hmm. want if somebody truly is sick, I don't want them at work. I right. don't want my office girls at work if they're sick. And I certainly don't want a caregiver because everybody, all of my clients, even if they're not elderly, they're compromised in some way. Mm-hmm. They're, they're not healthy people. Um, so, however, there's that fine line of, you know, so we require a doctor's note. You know, you go, you tell me you went to the doctor. That, that's fine. So now you have till the next morning to get us that note before you may return to work. Right. Um or it's considered an unexcused, you know, absence or whatever. So we are trying to crack down a little bit on that because as much as we want to work with people, you got to draw that line. You got to set that expectation that, you know, we understand things happen, but here's the guideline that we need to go by. And that's, you know, that's not easy sometimes because you need people to go to work, (laughs) but. Right. And, and you want to set the expectation that I don't want you to come to work sick but right. unless you're setting the expectation of, hey, I have a little sniffle and it's yeah. just, it, there's yeah. a fine line between, are mm-hmm. you lying to me so that you don't have that, to work? Yeah. Are you yeah. hungover? Mm-hmm. Are you? Oh, because we've had that too. And we've had right. actually people tell us that they're hungover and can't go to work. So I'm like, okay, well, at least they were honest, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it, I suppose I'd rather have honesty than somebody flat out lying to me, but there's a slap on the wrist. Don't do it again. Get your 
Mm -hmm. Get your yeah. life together. And yeah. every time I've ever been hung over, I've shown up to work and then I've just played mm -hmm. the, I'm an it's idiot, <laughs> right? I'm an idiot. I'm not going to do that again. And now uh -huh. I'm, you know, in my forties and I have a child. I don't typically do that. <laughs> no, I'm not hung over these days anymore. <laughs> it takes me four days to recover. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's not a good thing. <laughs> right. In my twenties, it took me about, you know, four hours to recover. And then I was ready yeah. to do it again for God's sake. Oh my God. Okay. Right. Tangent. <laughs> now, you manage, you know, obviously a group of people who are not coming to the office every day. They're going elsewhere. They're, they're, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of other people. So, you know, I've asked this question of, of a ton of individuals of, you know, the world is going remote, but you've always basically been managing before COVID, before all of this, a group of individuals right. who essentially are remote because, well, you're a home health care. We don't have eyes on them. Mm -hmm. Correct. So how do you, and you talked a little bit about some of the things that you do for your staff in order to keep that morale up, but how do you, I, I mean, there's got to be a huge amount of trust. Yeah. Um, so we, most of our clients are state clients. Mm -hmm. So I get them through the state and I get reimbursed to the state and I pay the um, employees as W-2 employees. Mm -hmm. But with that comes a lot of compliance. So in the world of private duty um, agencies, there's not that compliance piece of it. We're not regulated at all by the state for what we do. Crazy enough, that's how it is. Wait, but when you're when you're when you're dealing with the state. So wait, um, wait before you go on. Sorry, you're not we regulated. We don't have to be licensed. We don't have to be licensed for non-medical. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Well, as in Illinois, they have very strict um, compliance and licensing guidelines. We okay. don't have that here. Even Unless, non even non medical has to be. Yes. Oh mm -hmm. wow. Okay. okay. So the assisting hands down in um, like Illinois, they have a pretty stringent um, process they have to go through to get credentialed and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So, um, but because I work with state clients. I am heavily regulated and have to follow certain compliance rules, which is kind of good because that kind of forces you to do more mm -hmm. in the way of checking on people. So I have a, a gal who works in my office. She's a field supervisor and her job, her main job is to be out in the field visiting when caregivers are on shift with a client mm -hmm. and kind of goes and checks on them, make sure they're in uniform, make sure the client's happy doing things that they're supposed to be doing, making sure the caregiver is in fact there because mm -hmm. we've had that situation before. Um, and just that kind of stuff. So that, that's how we kind of keep eyes on everybody. So every 30 days they get a, um, an announced kind of visit. So that's how we sort of do that. You know, and then when she goes, she brings them a little, goodie bag and has like granola bars and hand sanitizer and just, you know, thanks for doing such a great job, but really it is to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah. And we also have a nurse that's like um, a contracted, I, I actually, she is a W2 employee too, but she's kind of per diem for certain clients need that extra level of um, kind of checking on. So I have a nurse as well that goes into another set of clients and um, that's mandated by the state. So Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of how we keep that in check. And it's worked out pretty good. There's been times where like, oh boy, we need to figure out this situation because it's not a good situation. And then, you know, oftentimes everything's going great and everyone's happy. So. Excellent. So you have somebody who's not only checking to make sure, you know, they're talking to the client, making sure that the client is happy, but you're, they're also checking the employee, making sure that the employee is there where they need to be and doing what they need to be. And, and yeah. do you have times where the employees all come together at a, at a specific location to? Not really. We had a, we had a holiday party. Um, so we had a two day like open house. And so they could come one of two days to get, we had lunch brought in, we had all kinds of treats and had, um, you know, goodie bags and stuff to give them for coming in. Um, that was really, that's really the only time there's really no other opportunity mm -hmm. for them to all kind of get together. That's right. just not how the nature of this kind of business. So, right. and how many caregivers do you have in total? Um, last check 52, I think it was 52. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, they're not all full time. Most are part time. We do have some. We have some that are family members taking care of their family through mm-hmm. the state. So, you know, that's a whole different animal. But um, so, yeah, including those people is like 52. Wow. And then I got three gals in the office full time. And mm-hmm. you have just one person who goes and does the rounds of checking on all 52. Yeah. So I have 45 clients. <clears throat> and so she, she does it through the course of a month. So she, every client gets, and of course the nurse does the uh, those other sets of clients that um, need that nurse visit as required by the state. So she, the other gal, the, stat, the field supervisor does the other clients. So it's not exactly um, you know, she's not doing 45 clients. So, right. Yeah. Wow. So technically two people out in the field. Yeah. Wow. How do you, as the owner, keep all of the parts moving in the right direction? <laughs> I mean, you said you yeah. have what, three office people. Mm-hmm. So I have, um, an, administ- an administrator who is kind of I hired her to kind of take on a lot of my role so I could kind of step away a little bit. So she kind of runs the daily show. Um, She's amazing. So between herself and me, that's what kind of keeps the the parts moving. Um, And then the other gal who's out in the field, she also does the onboarding in the office and the training in the office Mm -hmm. because they have to have skills um, assessments done per the state um and you know they have their orientation and training and stuff like that so she does handle that and then I have another full-time person that does kind of recruiting and then does the interviewing and does um she kind of backs up the field supervisor if she's out of the office she answers phones and stuff like that but yeah it's a lot it's a lot it's I was hoping to be able to step away a little bit hiring this you know full-time administrator but what it's done is it's it's giving me more time to actually do other things that I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'm not stepping away as much as I thought right. I would, but it's fine. I love working. So, um, and I can be flexible with my time so I can, you know, do stuff during the day if I need to, because I, mm-hmm. y- you're never off really. So it just allows you to be more flexible with your time. So, so. the advice to other people that's possibly looking at running their own business is you'll mm-hmm. you'll never actually be off of work. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, but you have to make a you have to make an effort. The first couple right. of years it it was really challenging. And it just it was a show. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. yeah. Um but you have to learn and you have to hire people. You have to be willing to spend the money to hire. And that's where, that's the point I'm, I've gotten to over in 2020 yep. or 2022 was that was my goal for 2022 is, you know, now I'm getting the revenue in, now I'm doing all these things and stuff. And now I need people because I can't grow if I don't have people to do all these things mm-hmm. because myself and one other person was not going to cut it. Just not possible. Right. So, so that's been a life. So in 20, before 2022, you, it was just you and one other office person. Yeah. And so during COVID, it was interesting though, because at that time, the majority of my clients were state clients still, but whose families took care of them. So there wasn't call-offs. There wasn't people, you know, couldn't make it to work. They just did because they were taking care of a family. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit of a different, it was actually nice during COVID because it was a little less stressful, I think, with trying to, and I didn't overly try to build too much because I didn't, it was really difficult with the protocols and the, you know, I was on four webinars a day trying to keep up with what's going on and the the standards and the, you know, just all the stuff. Um, So it was an interesting time. Luckily, we were in a place where it didn't cause too much Um, in the way of stopping like operations. Um, But after in 2021, it became very evident that, you know, I keep getting all these clients and I just can't, if I want to keep taking clients and I want to grow, I need to, I need to get some help. So that was my goal for 2022. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And and that was, you kind of touched on the, the next question I had for you, which was, you know, how did the, the pandemic affect you? and your business. It sounds like you were kind of in 
in a waiting pattern, but you had business because mm-hmm. a lot of the family yeah. members were continuing to take care of yes. their, their own family members. And how does that work? They, they work under you and they get paid by the state yep. to, okay. Yep. So I get reimbursed from the state. And then I hired them as a W-2 employee. So they have all the same qualifications that, you know, and all the same training and all that kind of stuff, the same supervision that everybody else gets. Um, They're still required. They're still, they still need to act like an employee. Okay. Uh, You know, because I'm paying them a paycheck and, but they'll, they get the benefits of being an employee too. Like if everyone gets a bonus at Christmas, I give them all a bonus as well, because why not? They're working hard and, Mm -hmm. Um, and most of them are like, oh my God, I never would have expected that, but yeah, why not? Um, so, but yeah, it was an interesting time. And I, I feel like if I was all private duty or all having to staff all those clients, it would have been extremely stressful and anxiety ridden because just the fear I had of that small group of clients that I had, that I still had to send outside people into their home was overwhelming for me. I just was worried all the time. Like, are they telling me they don't have these symptoms? And I wasn't testing and I never mandated a vaccine because I just don't believe that's what I, and I didn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and there was like, they would clock in on their phone and there were questions that came up COVID related. Do you have this, 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 and this? And, you know, um, if they answered yes to any of them, we'd have to question as to well, what's going on. And, you know, then you can't go to work. And it was, it was a rough time. I feel, I feel for the people that had 50 employees that they had to worry about. Cause I didn't worry about the family members they're living there. So if they all have COVID together, there's not a lot I can do about that. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, so that very small majority, we had some clients that didn't want any care and we would go, get their groceries and leave that at the step or just like quickly put it inside their door. And that was all they wanted. And, you know, it was challenging because people were fearful, but we did it, you know, we made it through, but. um, So some of the family members that are caregivers actually live in the same home. Oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes. Interesting. Or a wife, yeah. Or a daughter. We have a lot who's, you know, child, daughter, son will care for them and they don't live in the home, but you know, they're there every day and they have to, okay. you know, yeah. So. And then, and I'm, I'm wildly interested by this because what mm-hmm. happened if one of your clients got COVID, but needed care, needed help using the bathroom needed? I mean, yeah. What- yeah. So it happened a couple of times where, um, we had a client that had COVID luckily, they had a family member that was able to help them. It's never ideal because obviously the family member is trying to work and do that. That's why they have us in there because they don't have, you know, whatever. But um, there was one that we had that had ended up having COVID and the caregiver was fine. She's like, you know what? He has a mask on. I have a mask on. I got my gloves on. I'll wash my hands. I'll double mask, you know, whatever I have to do. She had the N95, whatever. She's like, I'm fine. You know, I, I'm okay, you know, but it was kind of a case by case. We really had to take each, every day. We had no idea what was going to happen. It was that crazy. Like, you, you know, you know, it's, we, we all, heard, we've all heard the stories of, you know, what people who are working in hospitals are, are still uh, you go into a hospital and I think they're all still wearing masks and Mm -hmm. I tell you that as soon as the mask mandates went away I was ripping that thing off my face going never again because never again yeah (laughs) I just I was one of the ones that every time I wore a mask for any you know any longer than 10 15 minutes I would get an instant headache Um, I even talked to my doctor about it I'm like I don't understand and and I have I have chronic migraines that I take medicine medicine for and everything else and so I just I mean I I couldn't stand wearing the mask so when when that yeah. went away and it again it, it was directly related to the fact that I got headaches you know this is not right. a political view in any way um so as soon as the mask went away I was like oh thank God but I would yeah. you know my mother was in the serv- in this in the service industry she had a perma mask on just like. Yeah. The people who worked or work in hospitals, work in the front lines that wore them for 10, 12 hours a day that were breaking out and had, you know, just these horrible things on their 
face. Yeah. Like, the human, not good. No, the humans are not meant to have something across their face 24 hours right. or 12 hours a day. Yeah. Um, it's just not, it, it's not meant to be like that. And so I feel horrible for, you know, those individuals, but it, it's eye opening to realize, you know, talking to somebody like you, who's, you know, obviously an essential business, you're giving, you're providing a service that many individuals, they need. Um, somebody who's not able to take a shower or to properly clean themselves or to get their own food or whatever the case may be, um, it's an essential you know, service. And, and people like me, who's not an essential service um, necessarily, uh, I did, I, I was able to work the entire time, but I was working from home, the security of my home. I barely ever left it other than go to the grocery store or to make a trip to Menards because I had a house project I was working on like the rest of the world. You forget um, very quickly the horrors of having to wear those masks for that yeah. long. And then to yeah. have somebody, you know, have the people who went, yep, I know I'm going to be around individuals with COVID. I work in a hospital. Yeah. I know I'm going to go into somebody's home who has COVID. Um, and have them be okay with that um, during a time period when everybody was terrified. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not, deal. <laughs> not, not a good time. <laughs> no, no. And now people are now people are like COVID. What, what, what do you mean COVID? It's not that scary, depending on obviously what you experienced. Yeah. There are people right. who lost their loved ones. And, um, you know, obviously everybody experienced it differently. But I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't lose anybody close to me. Um, everybody yeah. who, who I never got COVID, but everybody in my family did. Um, I just, for some reason was one of the lucky ones that never experienced yeah. it. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it is a, it's bizarre to think back and, and remember, and I'm hoping that my daughter will not, but remember the time when everywhere we went, we wore a mask and the yeah. people on the front line were wearing them, still wearing them. Time. Mm -hmm. all the time yeah my my girls still wear it though that's still a requirement of mine is to you have to be masked up gloves and a mask um and they have to obviously know the proper hand washing protocol and all that so but right yeah well when you're in close contact with somebody especially when they're immune you know when they have a you know a, a, what immunocompromised um mm -hmm. situation and and like you said a lot of your individuals maybe um it's still a very important thing. Yeah. And not to mention that the world right now, the entire world right now is pretty much sick because we were right. Right. all cooped up for two years and now we're all yeah. sharing our germs with each other. Fun times, right? Yeah. Yeah. At, I least, know. at least my daughter is sick every, pretty much every other week. Um, yeah. And then she brings it home to mommy and daddy, which is of course. so nice of her. Oh. So nice. I don't I know. miss those days. <laughs> no, no, no. I know it's it's so much fun. You know. Yeah. <laughs> the the I have a babysitter today, and she is um, personal note, side note, sorry, tangent. Um, she does. She's got a fear of uh, runny noses. I'm putting it nicely, and so she came down to my office here at my home, and she goes, "You're gonna have to help me with this one." And I'm like, "Oh dear, what?" <laughs> She goes, you just need to wipe her nose. I'm like, oh my gosh. Anyways, <laughs> side side note. So we are we're getting close to time. And okay. um I would like to ask you the question of the season, which I, I think is gonna be fun because you are now, you know, obviously five years in, you're a business owner, you run a unique business. Um, and that's why I was excited to talk to you today because it's different than, you know, any other company that I've spoken with uh thus far. But if someone, um, or I'm sorry, if, if you could change um, anything about your job or the practice that people have in your role, what would that be? Um, the job itself or how I handle the job? Um, I guess. Really anything. I mean, if, if. They, they got to be better at letting go a little bit more of, mm, delegating or fearful that um, 
something's not going to get done the way like I think it should get done. Nobody has anything to lose except you as an owner. So as your employees, they're great. And I have to say my, especially my main office gal, she takes her job very, very seriously. And I a hundred percent appreciate that, but no one loves your business like you do. Nobody feels the pain of the business like you do. And I have to do better with realizing it's okay to hand things off or to trust. And I'm getting better with that because the person I have in that role has demonstrated that she can handle things. Um, so that's that's been kind of a newer thing for me. But, um, and then just being able to take that, take that time to say, okay, I am not, because I have... <laughs> admittedly, the app we happen to use for our business phone um, is Ring Central. And so we're all connected on Ring Central. And then when caregivers text or call, it comes through this app. So it's not going to your personal phone. So we can kind of all see and stay connected with what's going on and you can read all the texts and all that. I'm getting, I've got to get better with not looking all the time, like even maybe logging out of the app every so often. <laughs> it's like hard for me, but because I don't want something to be missed that is critical. Although I don't say anything, I let them handle it. I am getting better with that. But I think that'd be the one thing I'd, if I could change would be just trying to, you know, things will be okay. But it's just that fear always that as an owner, that at the end of the day, all these people can leave and never come back again. And then you're still in the seat handling everything. Yeah. So trust and delegation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Trust, but verify. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, we all have to trust, but verify. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. something that we will, that we should be doing our whole lives. But um, I can only imagine, and this again, um, I, I think that, it is not unique to no to you know i've i've heard that from multiple people um yeah and 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 you're right you it is your baby it will always be your baby it will always be um you know you're always going to love it more than anybody else it's yours or hate it more than anybody else <laughs> Or hate it. So love yeah, or hate. It's aren't those, love hate. It's, yes. Oh, so it's, it's like so close together, the parallel. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Many, many days I wanted to turn off the light and just never come back again. I was like, can I do that? Can I really do that? Let me think. Hmm. And, and I, I, you know, when, as you were explaining that to me, another owner um, uh, that I had a, a recent conversation with, um, his goal was to be able to step away and not have to think about his business and have the trust in all of the employees that are running it to be able to actually mm -hmm. step away and know mm -hmm. that everything is running. Um, yeah. And that was his goal for this year. And I believe that I've actually seen him now step completely away um, nice. on multiple times and be like, yep, I'm not there. Don't call me. Call this person. Yeah. He's now running the business. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you're you're doing the thing that you promised yeah. yourself you could do, which I yeah. can, to me, that's, that means that you're successful. A, a business owner, um, should not be working 80 hours a week. That's not what you, that to me, unless you absolutely want to, and you don't have anything else, you know, going on in your life, but that should not be the goal. The goal should be that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to work for. And I, I've been able to transition to that somewhat. Um, I just like working too much. So that like, oh, if I'm not going to be in the office, what am I going to do? I'm going to clean my house. I'm going to, I don't know, go to the gym. You know, I mean, I feel kind of almost like this, like owner's guilt sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I have to have a conversation with myself, Robin, you're the owner. You can go to the gym if you really want to. So that you're okay. Right. But that's, to me, that's the goal too, is to be able to not, maybe not hundred percent step away, but to get to that point where, yep, call the gals and they'll take care of you. So uh, yeah, I, I'm a, I am a workaholic. And I've, I've come to terms with that, um, not so that I can boast about it, but so that I can recover. 
get better from it. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a, it is a sickness <laughs> to, it, it to is. be able to balance things better, right. but yeah. There, there are times where I'm sitting, I'm supposed to be watching a movie with my family and all I can think is I really got to find a reason to get away from this situation to go and send an email. And then I yeah. go, I'm a horrible person. Why am I trying to run away from my family to go and yeah. work? Like that, this is an issue. Like I need, I need therapy. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> Oh, well, it's good you can recognize it. That's the first step to recovery, they say. So yes. is being able to recognize your, your illness. <laughs> yes. I I um so I'm I'm working on that. Um I, I'm allotting time where I'm not allowed to check my email. I'm yeah. not allowed to open up LinkedIn. I'm not allowed to do not allowed to do any of it. Have to just focus on yeah. family time, which is wildly important or mm-hmm. me time or whatever for whomever is listening to this it is vitally important to unplug completely mm-hmm. um so now yeah um, I, I echo that 100 percent. yep yep especially as a business owner because if you burn yourself out in that first year of ownership or the first two years or the first three years you're gonna fail yeah. And it almost happened. Like I said, there were many days that I just thought, you know what? I, I can't do this. I just can't. And I'm, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not going to go in. I'm just not going to go in ever again. And then you reason with yourself and you can do that, obviously. However, the first year and a half, it affected me physically, emotionally, my relationships, even my son said, mom, you, you gotta do something like this is, right. you, you're gonna, I'm worried about you. Right. So you know, you just have to kind of, you got to just, you just do it. You just got to make up, you know, make your family important, make yourself important. And, um, you know, then it becomes kind of easy almost like, Oh, that's kind of nice. Right. <laughs> so, but. Yeah. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, it yeah. truly has. Um, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, um, for a couple of reasons, <clears throat> if they're looking for a job, want to get into the, um, you know, into the industry, want to learn about, you know, what it's like to, to work with you, or if somebody is looking, um, because they need a a caregiver, um, how would they go about doing that? So our, they could call our main number because that's how it kind of gets triaged through, through, um, the front desk. And then Kima, who is my administrator, she would kind of take the reins from there. Um, our office number is 262-721-1155. They could always shoot me an email to rilario at assistinghands.com. And I could, I'd be happy to talk to anybody, obviously at any time and then, you know, transition them to the right person. But, um, so those would be the two main, the main ways they could get in touch with us. Excellent. And that will be included in the show notes. So okay. if anybody is interested in reaching out to Robin, please uh, check the show notes. Uh, her contact information will be listed there. Um, again, Robin, it has been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, don't worry. It was great. Thanks, Leanne. Take care. Thank you again for listening to Let's Talk HR. I appreciate your time and support. Without you, the audience, this would not be possible. So don't forget that if you enjoyed this episode, to follow us, like us, or share us. Have a wonderful day.